we have a group that wants to share a little bit from our all school read from last month. Big voice, and we would like to share our thoughts on it. But first, a fun fact Did you know that it was written by Sharice herself? <coughs> we were talking about the main idea, but we couldn't come up with one. So, here are some so there were so many big ideas in this book. So, we would like to share a few. A few. First, when people doubted her. But she didn't say, hey, you're right, and just give up. She said, well, actually, she said not to think. She just ignored them. Um, um, this is an important skill. Even though it might be hard sometimes, um, you have to believe in yourself. If Charisse can, so can you. Second. Second, she listened to everyone. The sick, the poor, the elderly, she listened to all. She listened to their concerns, their arguments. My point is, when you listen to others, they listen to you. This is very important, because if others don't listen, they'll never be heard. And if you are not heard, no one will ever know what you are running for. Second, uh, wait, wait. <laughs> Charisse was an inspired heart by her mom in the army. She saw that, wow, my mom serves and helps all these other people. And in exchange, she asks for nothing. I want to be like her, and she was. Charisse never asked for money or bribes after she helped someone. She did it for free. Charisse was good at helping others, and she did this her whole life. Charisse was working with the Native American tribes, but she noticed that her own was white, but that didn't discourage her. She thought that she would change that, and she did. One way she did this was by walking around and asking people to vote for her to be in a higher position of work. Charisse is a brave and kind person. She has done so many things and is still doing more. We hope this book in Charisse has inspired you like it inspired us. Thanks. for 
the part of the school day that we enjoy. My favorite part is PE. Oh, it's cool. We sit because we set schools. And why is for yummy meals that the cafeteria ladies make for us every day? Space is for space because we need our space. H is for hops because the hop dances. O is for outside time. G is for great people of Mary Hope. <laughs> A is for our amazing school. N is for the nurse that helps us every day. Help us, helps us each day. All right, so if these are the fourth graders that all volunteered. They had, they are some of, of the many who led our last all school meeting right before vacation. And this was a kind of a reprise. You missed singing one song, and, uh, but otherwise it's kind of what it was. Um, and I think it was just, an amazing tribute to these guys who are both real, they were all thinkers as we were kind of making adapt adaptations for this presentation, but they're also really courageous and really took care of each other and were great communicators. Um, so please welcome me in thanking them for coming to present to you.
We are moving towards the first draft on December 19th. Tonight we have our principals here who will be talking a little bit about their budgets, their schools, um, and, and help them to give a, a little bit better picture to the board of what the FY24 budget will be supporting in all of our schools. And we do have two principals that are absent today. They are going to be coming on the 19th. So just so you know, we are being that part of the tonight. Um, so, uh, this information is really important. Um, we're going to be talking about this letter um, on Wednesday when we meet with our finance committee to talk about the implications as we look at the our increases are um, and fine tune things in our budget to be ready on the 19th. And to another date, which we are waiting on December 1st, is really kind of the first, this tax credit one is the first piece of state information we really get. The second one is December 15th when we get our equalized pupil count, which is kind of everything for us. It tells us um, what kind of revenue we're going to be getting from the state. So it's our, it's our student count um, equalized by waiting. Um, so just to briefly review the um, tax commissioner's letter and, and what was uh, contained with it, um, it, it, right now there's a $64 million um, Unreserved or unallocated surplus uh, at the state level going into FY24. If that 64 million is applied to budget statewide to the end fund, uh, the overall increase, and this is this is like static budgets, right? Like budget to budget, the tax rate would be 3.7 percent increase. If the legislature decides not to put that 64 million towards uh, the end fund with the 8.3%. Uh, the, the yield, I won't go into too much detail on, on some of these numbers. We'll be sharing this information with you again on the 19th as well. Um, the difference that's pertinent to the development of our budget, but um, things that are important, our average homestead tax rate is lower prior to CLA. So the expectation is that given the the grandness and what's happened in the housing market, the, even though the tax rate year to year goes from one thirty eight to dollar thirty one, with the, the CLA impacts on our tax rate, uh, that will result in a move from a dollar fifty, which was at five twenty three, to a dollar fifty seven in five twenty four. Okay, so we're moving. That's it. It is as an average. Yeah. 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 Um, and then finally, the, the it looks like currently, and I, think, I believe we shared this last week in our meeting, statewide budgets due to inflationary pressures, largely um, settlements, new settlements with um, employees uh, and other factors. Uh, in, in, I think, beyond education right now, overall statewide increases of 8 to 10 percent are about where budgets are currently falling from an, uh, a preliminary assessment by the uh, Agency of Education. And the uh, average equalized for people spending, and this is, again, this is kind of looking ahead, this is uh, projecting based on current information, um, equalized pupil would be up to 20,000. 155 with a rate of growth of 9.7%. Some of that is an increase in cost, but then there is, we are still, statewide, we are still in decline overall in terms of overall student population. I believe that's about a 1% drop in student population. So that's, that's part of the factor when we talk about the average per pupil. Uh, the, the rate of growth in terms of net spending was 8.52% before factor the, the loss of uh, students and other students. Uh, so what we work, I mean, this is generally good news. I think overall um, there's a surplus. The, the rate is increasing significantly. We um, are interested in, in new coming into this budget year that given all of the factors happening um, to budget statewide and nationally that we would be higher than our typical three to four percent. Um, and we'll be uh, again talking more about that uh, for the finance committee on Wednesday and then on the 16th. Thank you. 
we also tonight have a visitor, Tim Williams, who is here. And he's going to be presenting to, to give a kind of a budget view of our whole budget. A part of our budget is the Berg Center budget. Um, Tim has um, graciously accepted an invitation to come early. He's got a few presentations later on, but he's coming early for us because this tape fit in um, for us in terms of our um, sequencing. And um, if it's okay, I'm going to hand over the mic to Tim to share a little bit more about the budget. He's got a presentation, and I've got some handouts in there. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me tonight. i uh, hoping to share with you some information to help your process of budgeting. Uh, and as a board, you have monumental tasks, just like our board has monumental tasks, and two of your colleagues have two monumental tasks, not just one. So, what I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit about what's going on at the Career Center, and also uh, share with you some budgeting, preliminary budgeting information. I think you guys, I think Peter, I think you said you're on draft one. Uh, at this point, we're on draft two already, because we know that we need to get you, we need to get you proper information so that we can budget So, uh, first of all, I'll share with you some information. <coughs> and about what's happening at the prison. A lot of good things are happening. Uh, the gentleman in the bottom right hand corner is a graduate of our theater program. He's recently nominated for an Emmy Award. Those of you who are fans of The Office, like my daughter is, uh, knows every line from every episode, knows exactly who that is. This gentleman was a, a, a regular in the season, the last season of The Office as well. So he's an accomplished actor, and he's back to start here. We also are uh, collaborating with uh, the uh, Homes First Vermont organization uh, to build them a tiny house that they will use in a tiny house village that they're trying to, to promote to help with the housing situation in Vermont. Uh, they're trying to find some space in Middlebury, and meanwhile, we're building them a house that's literally on the trail. Uh, the picture you see here is a picture of uh, the tiny house of these sort of uh, in our in our building, and this is right before it had to be moved into the plus garage because once the trust, roof trusses go on, they wouldn't be able to get out of the building. So the garage door of the plus garage is much higher, so we're using the plus garage to complete the project. Also, uh, here's a picture of some pre tech students who are building turning shades to hurl objects, companies mostly, for the light from distance and then modify the trend shapes and try to uh, perfect and increase the distance of the program of objects. We also have a very strong FFA component in collaboration with you guys, uh, and they went to Indianapolis recently and did really well. In fact, one of the students, uh, remember there's 70,000 FFA people, students at the convention. And they were still about this right here. So I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, the college prep institution that Hanford has become. Uh, it might surprise many people, and in fact, the data surprised me when I first saw it. And we do send a lot of students to college. Uh, back in 2016, 63% of Hanford students went off to college. And you can see the blue line is Hanford Career Centers. And the green line is CTE centers across the state. You can see that Hanford has always outpaced CTE centers in Vermont as a whole. And on average, we send about 50% of our students to post secondary education, whether that's a trade school or a career college or a board or what have you. Now, as far as the programs we offer at the Hanford, uh, this is a listing of careers that are projected to increase over from 2020 to 2030. The blue line represents Vermont, the red line represents the United States. So you can see, for example, the first one is food prep and, and uh, serving the industry. You can see in Vermont it's projected to grow significantly uh, as opposed to across the United States. And if you look at the listing of programs, you can see that 
We have quite a number highlighted in yellow that are directly related to programs we offer. So if you look at the top four, the top four highest growth industries in Vermont have programs that are directly related to Canada has programs that are directly related to those four items. And then the other are yellow highlighted ones as well. And the ones that aren't highlighted, we have students who end up going to post-secondary schools and end up going into those fields. We just don't have a program that directly relates to those fields. So that's the positive sign for the first century. And this is the Vermont Department of Labor Statistics. Now, the 10% does have some challenges. Uh, you're facing fiscal challenges, budgetary challenges, just like we are. Uh, and, and I'll talk about some of the unique challenges we're facing as a person. Uh, but also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the comprehensive global needs assessment, which is some would say the bane of our existence, but some would say the guide, the guidebook that we use to, to improve. And that's the, again, that's the strategy we're taking to improve. Uh, and what has come out of that process is we have, we have had high staff turnover. We have some areas that need to be rejuvenated, and we have a moment that's not where it should be. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But also, we also were uh, identified as needing to improve our non traditional student enrollment. So, for example, that might mean more uh, female students in auto tech and diesel, or maybe more male students in health services programs. So it's a two-way street. We need to improve our gender balance in all our programs. And that, that's not unique to us. That's common across all of CTEs. Now, as far as enrollment is concerned, here's the trend line for um, enrollment since 2014. Now, I've got total numbers here in each school year and the March numbers, because those are the two big ones that calculate go into the calculation for CTE enrollment. You can see that you know it's, it's up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on, mostly because in the second semester we don't often have the same number of students we had in the first semester. They decide in the second semester to do something different, so they're not with us. So it's common for our enrollment to be down in the spring semester. And I'd like to point out to you uh, 2019, October 2019 to March 2021. There's a break in the trend. It's down, 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 set down, set up, down, up, down. You see a decline. Yeah. And then you can think about history and what happened at the time period and you get an idea what may be a possible. I also want to point out in the yellow shaded areas on the screen now, during part of that downward trend, that's the data that was used to produce the comprehensive local needs assessment. So that data was produced and given to us by the daily when we were at our work as far as the moment. You notice that when the yellow stops, you notice in Romans and back over. And that's a positive sign. So we are heading in the right direction at the moment. And the trend line is it's not level, uh, it goes up slightly to the right, as you can see a great trend. Line. So that's a good sign. Goes over the future. Uh, we also are unofficially projecting 136.68 FTEs for the coming year, which is uh, not too shy. So, as far as the is concerned, the yellow row is current enrollment by Parker School. Uh, so you can see the over is 44.8 FTE. Now FTE, uh, forgive me if, if you already know what this means, but there's probably someone in this room that doesn't know what FTE stands for. FTE stands for full-time equivalent student. So in other words, again, if we have a student for half the time, that counts as 0.5. Even though, even though it's one human being, it counts for our purposes as 0.5. So that's why you see fractions. So we have, as of October, we have 148.8 FTEs, which is uh, uh, one of our highest numbers. You can also see that the high for each partner school and the average and the low for each partner school. So you can see Middlebury, the highest we've ever had here in Canada is 76.67. 
our estimated tuition has been from twelve thousand five hundred seven dollars with the bond payment of sixteen thousand six eighty four. And you can see back there down there at the bottom, you can see that if you didn't have a bond payment, we're actually looking at a reduction in the estimated tuition next year. With the bond, we're looking at fourteen point three percent. So this is how that translates into uh, from back in the money from the from the state. So you take the uh, estimated local assessment and the two columns again, one is for without the debt service, one is for the new debt service. And you factor in the tuition from the state. We get a total tax assigned tuition rate of twenty three thousand three eighty two. We did not have the, the debt service in twenty seven five sixty with debt service. So we might as well just focus on the right column now to give you an idea of where we are at this moment in time. We're looking at about 13% in tuition for Christmas. If we didn't have the best service, we'd be looking at a negative course. So we have more budget revisions to come. Uh, we're not done yet. We have some strategies that we're going to use. For example, uh, mentioned debt service. We've had four years of debt service left on the old bond. We have some reserves. To me, that's a very, very wise use of reserves to use it to fund something that has an end of life. You don't want to use your reserves to pay an electric bill, for example. But it might be wise to use your reserves to pay four years remaining on the bond. So we're going to pay that off. That's what we're looking to do. We have a couple of other things. Uh, we're looking at restructuring, and we have a couple of other tests we're pretty sure we're going to be able to pay. So, the numbers that I put out there are the absolute worst case scenario. I don't think we're going to be there when we're done with the budget. That's where we are at this moment in time. And that's why I beg for you to put this presentation on because uh, i got to give you what we have at the moment. And at the moment, it's, it's not great. I'll be the first to tell you that. Uh, we're working hard to bring that stuff in. Uh, and the other important thing to remember is that higher enrollment. Lower tuition. So the more our six semester average goes up, the less the less money per student is going to cost. Okay. So improved increased enrollment is a good sign for the future of what's coming up. And at this point, I'm happy to take any feedback or questions or whatever. Um, I have a question. Is there been any um, discussion at the state level about like assuming that other Not to my knowledge, there's no discussion about changing how the, the numbers calculated. Other than there's discussions about changing the way CPUs are funded wholesale. Uh, in, in our opinion, it would be a really good thing. Because we don't like the way it's structured right now. We have to come to you and say, hey, we're gonna, we want to pay X number of dollars in your, your budget to pay for the services that we're providing. Uh, we prefer that the state figure out a different way to fund CPUs. But there has been no, and I'm aware of no conversation about how the six semester average might be changed. There could be discussion on this number. Thank you. This is very clear. And it's found to present your results going on as well as, you know, what we have talked about. In the past, when we put this data, um, we were sort of given an estimate of how much of the portion that you have to pay in our district is typically higher than the other districts or schools because we typically have more students. So, do you have an estimate for, for that part of what you're doing, or is that something that comes to the draw down the road? Right. Are you referring to the other types of numbers that they have? Yes. I'm saying wrong, but I'm, I'm saying sort of like the. What's the sort of the tuition for the middle grade? Well, how much are you spending for the middle grade? Or the uh, middle grade high school? Like, to charge for the pay? It's up to the 10,000 of the 16,000. Is it just that? Is it that? That's the part that has multiple groups and one group. The other group. The 16,000 times the letter. 
um, a pretty big fifth grade, I think there's nine, and i um, not too sure about our numbers for K, but it actually was pretty small, so we're not going to be um, maybe some tuition students and others that we don't know about right now. Otherwise, we're also, like Jen said, excited to be getting back to some of the things we were doing before the pandemic. We'll be um, skiing and having our residents and continuing with uh, multi-age activities that we always enjoy. Um, and it's a small but mighty group as many of you read in the paper and we're all pulling together and doing everything that needs to get done with some shortages here and there, but um, it's a committed group of people as you know and, and it's we're excited to be planning for next year. So, uh, Graybridge is also a STEAM course. We have 44 students this year and anticipate having the same number next year. We will have three classrooms, um, combined classrooms, which we've had since way before my time, um, doing 11 and pedagogically incredibly sound. K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, fairly evenly balanced in terms of numbers. Um, we, have, we will be maintaining the same level of staff throughout, so our budget is really just the increase of salary and inflation, etc. That's basically where it is. We will continue our um, K-5 inquiry into engineering. Um, we're, we're pretty much involved in that all the time. The staff focus this year is on developing vocabulary for students for many different reasons um, and using that as an inquiry base and also really looking into our inquiry practice. So every teacher is trying to teach a subject area such as handwriting through an inquiry process rather than a direct explanatory um, conversation. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, Amy Johnson, Shore Elementary. Um, so Shore Elementary is working at coming together um, with all stakeholders. On the Thursday before Thanksgiving, we had a wonderful luncheon where we had over 70 families, grand grandparents, aunts, uncles come in to join students in the gym and long tables and have a meal together. And it was really um, spoke to the culture and community of Shoreham where there's this great support from the families, staff who are involved, and this couldn't have happened without staff that care and put in the time to connect with families. And they really, the staff just want to collaborate to improve student learning. And that is what we're focused on is coming together um, to strengthen the learning at Shoreham. And we have 70, 77 students this year at Shoreham and we anticipate the numbers to be similar next year and we'll continue that staffing to offer robust support for all the students so we can continue our good work. Thank you. Oh, for the key lack. Come on over. So the other two of us here in the key club, Wizzle and myself, the co-principals this year. Um, hopefully, we can get this down through next. So again, I think our goal and our hope is that when our students come home and again, our staff go home to their families are talking about all the good things that are happening at moms and their experience and so on. So when we think about our vision and our goals, um, we're committed to support all learners. Um, this year, we had an opportunity to shift our leadership team um, and structure, which allowed us to really reflect 
on how to best support our community, our students, um, our school, and think about how to foster a positive school culture. That's been our, our true goal this year. Um, we're continuing um, to spend a lot of time understanding moms. As you know, we have transition um, with moms in the last couple of years to thinking about where we were, where we are, where we're going. Um, we continue to do that. Um, on a side note, this summer, when Kim and I got together as a formal leadership team, we had a lot of time to spend collaborating and thinking about what that vision would be. And we had a significant amount of staff that came together um, in the summer to talk about that as well in terms of some of the initiatives um, and, and goals that we had. Um, so we had a lot of time to be able to process that. We continue to process that as a team. Um, and the kid was going to share a few of those goals that we have. Good evening, everybody. Um, our, we have two goals that we're kind of thinking about this year and also thinking about the importance of next year. And so one of them is around relationships uh, with students and caregivers. So we feel really fortunate to be carrying over our leadership model that we have this year for next year um, and maintaining our dean of climate and culture who's um, been able to do some work with clubs and teams, but also help us think about how we um, support students in a systemic way so that it's durable over time. Um, and additionally, uh, our leadership director has helped us support our um, pretty new uh, teaching team that we have this year. We have phenomenal staff, um, and it's a lot of money that I spend time with law firm and teachers um, and help them uh, feel like they become committed and valued members of our uh, teaching team. Um, it also allows us to take time with uh, students and families, which is super important as we work to shift time and culture. Um, our, our next goal is how to set testing instruction at their level and in, in, in areas of interest from teachers that they feel connected to. Um, and this goal is really focused on both our schedule and also our teammate structure, which many, many of you know we shifted this year from straight grade teams. Um, we had last year with pretty large team sizes to smaller teams um, where teachers felt more connected to students and families and students felt more connected to teachers. Um, and there's lots and lots of benefits to the structure and also to our schedule this year and we're looking forward to embarking on a journey with our teaching staff this year to think about whether or not the structure that we have right now and the schedule that we have right now is the schedule that we hope to have. Um, in the future. So we started conversations about, around that and um, we're, we're, we're anticipating and looking forward to staffing but we're staying the way they are so that we can continue to make shifts um, that meet the needs of our diverse learners um, as well as our middle schoolers, um, our really special group of students. Uh, and we spend a lot of time thinking about the difference between sixth graders and eighth graders and how we can address their individual needs but also um, ensure that our school feels like a community. Um, and we're both going to talk about special education and um, intensive needs care educators, but it's been a priority of us this year, for us this year, um, to hire uh, skilled care educators. And um, we've done a fantastic job with the help of the central office. Um, and their role in our school is really invaluable and important. And we're looking forward to. Um, maybe in the first year as well. So, thanks so much. Hi everyone, Justin Campbell, High School Principal. Um, I guess I'm not the favorite, but I am the last, so I don't know what that means. Um, so, on the one hand, our, our budget is sort of uh, status quo. Uh, we, have, we also, like many other schools, anticipate our enrollment being relatively flat. Um, we're picking up maybe 10 or so students for next year. Uh, and, and going into the future, you know, we look like a school that is continuing to be 500 to maybe 550, bouncing up a little bit, up and down a little bit over time. Uh, but pretty consistent there. We had also, um, you know, our, our staffing situation was, was pretty static. Uh, you know, lovely staff, incredibly talented. Um, and, uh, I think thankfully returned. Having said all of that, there's a lot of work, a lot of really exciting work that we are tackling and that we need to do, quite honestly. So our, our staff, beginning last spring and then 
um, chugging along into this year has been really doing a lot of thinking about uh, goal setting, what we need to tackle. Uh, sometimes in education, it feels like we're constantly bouncing between uh, from one initiative to another, all the catchy acronyms that no one can remember. Uh, so we were hoping to really grab onto some sort of longer term goals and priorities. Uh, so here they are. Uh, number one, we need additional flexible pathways for our students. So I didn't know if you were going to be talking today, but um, we've had some wonderful conversations, early conversations with the Hanford Career Center and looking at some of the impediments that get in the way for our students taking classes there. Uh, and some of those are imposed by us, potentially. Some of those are potentially imposed by the, the Career Center. You know, again, not, uh, we're not trying to prevent students from being in the Career Center, but sometimes choices we make because we are two organizations, both organizations can get in the way. So ironing those out. Uh, and, and it goes beyond the career center. Our, our students, we have students for one reason or another. Some are, are not ready to be in a traditional classroom. Some really have interests that pull them um, a little bit further afield than, than a traditional classroom might, might allow. Uh, and so I think we, we have work to do there. We need to be building some, some additional uh, options that keep our students engaged and really speak to their interests and their, and their culture and values. Uh, we need to work on simplifying things. The job of education, you're, you're seeing educators across the country, across our state, leave education right now. There's a lot of reasons for that, uh, but I think the, the ever-building complexity of the job is, is one of them. Uh, so when we're looking at a learning management system managed that, when we're looking at there's lots of choices and there's lots of um, at any given moment, there's lots of things that we're, we're as leaders, asked to make decisions on. Uh, I, I think, for me, and our staff really spoke clearly about this, we need to work towards um, simplifying things, making it more workable, and sort of making the job of being an educator easier. And finally, um, you know, others have touched on it, we have work to do with school culture and community, uh, really maintaining that as a focus, um, pushing pushing on our discipline practices, how we handle students in crisis. Um, this, is, this is a tough time for students, for educators. Um, so we have, we have real work to do there. So on the one hand, sort of a status quo budget, but I didn't want to let this brief opportunity with you all go by without touching on the fact that you have a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I feel lucky to be here. We have the, the, the group of people the thoughtfulness, the, the intensity, the dedication that the staff bring to all of this goes me away all the time. Um, so, I think I'm the last one. I don't know what you're going to over here, but I assume we'll hatch. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the Um, thank you so much. It's always so fun um, to be on the receiving side of the um, not so budget reports. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I the one thing I feel like I didn't hear from anyone, and I and maybe expect everything's going so swimmingly, um, but I didn't hear about sort of holes that need to be filled in terms of positions or you really wish you had XYZ person or program or thing and that would make things work better. Um, does anyone have anything like that? that they, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're reading all the time about how we can't hire enough anyone and I know that we are still trying to hire. Um, but nobody spoke to sort of how that's impacting and whether or not their budget is shifting because they either can't fill or they decided to no longer try filling. Um, well, this is good, Randy. I, I would say um, at the central office level, as we look at some of our grants and Positions that we had hoped to fill, um, I think over the last year or so, we, we have done that where we had a position we posted. If you couldn't find anyone, we decided, okay, we had it out there long enough, we're going to now think about it at least for this one. Um, I think as a whole, we're not giving up yet on being able to fill some positions. 
going into the next year, but I think this is something that we'll be talking about in the next team. We'll talk about our student services budget and student need, which Justin referred to um, I think beautifully. That we, we are having to think really differently about what our students need, and we're looking at this as comprehensively and holistically as we can. Some of that does involve thinking about current staffing structures that we have in place and thinking about ways to adapt them. Our historic, we have a teacher, we have a paraprofessional, and that whole model, um, I, I think we've been forced to look at it differently as we haven't been able to hire paraprofessionals. Um, you know, especially the one-on-one -on -one intensive needs for professionals. So that, that has forced us, I think, in a lot of powerful ways to look back, not just at the positions, not looking out there, but looking internally at the at our structures and how can we best support the students. So this is definitely ongoing work that um, we are thinking about as we're building this question. Sure, thanks for asking. Um, you know, each so I'll get right to it. I, I think um, mental health supports are, are hugely on my mind. Our, our community, our students' access to um, outside counselors is pretty limited, right? The, 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 I don't know if anyone has provided to a security counselor for themselves and their children, but um, it's, it's really pretty limited out there. And so schools become really, really fill that need. So I have currently two CSAC clinicians at the high school. Um, we have budgeted 2.5. Um, we have long had 2.5, but the, the 0.5, to my surprise, is never built uh, because it's a half time division. Uh, and then we have one um, prevention specialist on, on staff as well, plus our school counselors. And our, all of those folks are, I feel badly that I'm constantly asking them to push. Now, I know you said the limit was X, but how about X plus 5 or X plus 6? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a huge need. I think also, uh, we have students who need, um, one way or another, they need their world to be smaller than a typical high school class. So, for because of social dynamics, because of struggles they're having, you know, a typical NUHS class with 20 students and the sort of hustle and bustle of the school um, is, is really challenging. And so, we're thinking about and, and sort of beginning this early stage of you know, looking at what's happening out there with some alternative educational programming. Um, you know, what would it look like to have for, for some students who have been to need to have much smaller classes with some intensive support? Um, that would cost staffing. Um, just, you know, wherever you did that, if you wanted to do a science class like that, that would impact staffing. And then finally, um, and I'll talk about the mic, because um, uh, I could go on, but, um, you know, I think intervention is something that's, that's really like, at the high school station, you had sort of, and I'm sure um, Cole will take through all of this, we had sort of special education where we supported some, some students who had some specific learning disabilities uh, and, and other challenges. And then we had regular education, not a lot in between. So we, we started adding some of those positions. Caitlin's been wonderful about working with some of the grant opportunities and, and just putting them there. Uh, but coming out of COVID, those students need a lot of support um, beyond potentially what's, I mean, again, we have. Amazing features, but when you have 20 students in front of you, yes, you can differentiate, but it might be really hard to find time to connect directly with Justin and really zero in on what his need is and how it's supporting. Um, so, those are a few areas that I feel well supported here. You know, and you can do a lot of reallocation, so I don't know if it's necessarily a whole, but it's certainly things that I spend a lot of time thinking about. It's cool. Um, but also to say we are managing quite well, so it's not as though we are talking about it gaping hole. Um, and I think probably when you talk with support services in, in the future, our interventions, which we were so happy to get last year for uh, at point five, we now have another uh, wonderful intervention this year at point five that because there are staffing issues, I believe, um, or lack of uh, enough special educators, our interventionists, totally capable, totally wonderful, wonderfully capable to do this, is providing almost all of our special ed services, which means we don't actually have an interventionist. And so that's, that's a piece of really trying to figure that, that out. 
Um, the other thing that comes up is because of changes, we now only have really one staff meeting a month, which is not enough time to do deep work. And so I would really love to see a time put into the calendar that honors school-based work, not to take away from district-based work, but to deepen that and have it be more coherent within schools, because that's a really, really important thing for schools to have in order to function really well. So those are just two things. Yeah, I was in a uh, staffing 
the building every day, I was hoping it would be easier this year, and I think it's not. It's probably more complex this year. I've just gotten a little bit better at it, maybe. Um, I would say the average mm, seven to 12 people out every day. Um, and our priority is obviously students who have art in classrooms, and students who have um, the needs who might have one-on-one um, -on -one supports or um, things like that. Um, I think we built a pretty good system with some redundancies in it so that particularly, like we've been pretty deliberate so that kids who have kind of the most complex needs have multiple staff who are trained to support them. Uh, there have been occasions when, um, you know, it's not a good situation, but I'm saying most of the time it is pretty great. Um, the staff have been amazing. I think the impact of, I mean, like the impact is, is many fold, but um, the lack of consistency for kids is really, really hard. And there are a lot, like, nobody's trying to be out, right? There are a lot of reasons why people are out. Um, but it's just really hard for kids. Um, and there's not much we can do about that. Um, I also think that um, there are a lot of people filling in for people in really quiet ways. Like when the kitchen, when our kitchen who normally has four staff had like one or two, um, people that showed up. And I think Tracy, has, you know, they talked about that story um, under Tracy, and I think that. Um, it would be great to somehow be able to recognize the amount that people are giving up for like Stephen and I cover a lot of duties in most days. Um, but there are, we can't do all those duties. And it, while it seems like lunch and recess seems to me superfluous and not in, in need of high staffing, it's actually a really important time because it's so unstructured because it seems to struggle the most who maybe don't have somebody with them, really need that consistent support. Um, and so when a kindergarten teacher every Friday has lunch with a class, regardless of staffing, and that she's giving up her lunch to make a decision to keep with her kids to make sure that it's consistent for them, um, I think it's a really big deal. Um, and there's not a lot of free time in elementary schools. I don't know if you're in here, but there's like, I really didn't want to ask him to get the last word. Um, you know, everything Jen said, I think it's true, and I think true, that's the particular question. Last year, we, I took my interventionist and used my interventionist as a sub more than I would have liked. That the staff that I talked about um, at the end of last year and going into this year, and we built kind of like Jen said, like redundancy. So that there, I don't think there's been a day this year where that's been the whole day. There's been like fill-ins for 30 minutes to half hour, or 45 minutes. Um, the other thing I would say, though, because Jen and I are the only principals with um, pre-K, staffing pre-K with the ratio is getting enough people with that qualification and having that be absolutely positively the ratio of kids um, to adults cannot be broken. In fact, around with that, um, kids with special needs who have one-on-one -on -one needs. In my school, um, I have three to four staff for 15 kids in pre-K, and then the rest of the school, which has a large percentage. Um, and this is my way of saying, since, um, you know, I think when I started, I made a joke, and I, I wasn't really meant to be a joke. What is profound about what we need is consistency. Like that's like that's what I need. I need enough consistency with everything that's going on in the world so that my team can work. Um, and since I'm here with the invitation, we need a vision for pre-K. Um, we have a lot of administrators working on pre-K and thinking about what's possible, but until we know what we're building or not building, it's a really for lack of a better term, frustrating process. So I, as somebody who has a pre-K in my building, would like to know are we building towards something big or is the status quo um, so that we can do that work. And when we don't know exactly where we're headed, that's not. Thank you.
I think Justin will have one more thing. <laughs> I, I will just echo, I think, what Matthew said about consistency. I think in very um, large things that's done that we all said are available to, I think we have a huge debt to our substitutes. It's one of the least attractive jobs in the world, but there are some very committed and gracious substitutes. And in uh, our case, we have a small group of dedicated folks that feels like Paul, you know, when Paul will show up. But I don't know if every building is able to have that, and I don't know what it would take to try and build that by building, because I think that would allow consistency, and it would surprise me if we ever had a day with too many steps. But if the person who was filling in as a building sub or an extra, pair of pants just was already knew that's where they were gonna be, then there might be more people who want to apply and wouldn't have a headache of calling around and seeing who would show up and that whole process if there's anything we can do to fix that a little bit would be great. Thank you so much. This has been really informative. Um, one thing I'd like to follow up on, um, just when you talked about simplifying things for staff, and uh, I really put that out for everyone, right? Because what I'm hearing here is the complexity for the staff. So what can we do, you know, as a board, to really support you in that effort? Um, because I think with everything that's being put on people's plates, if there is some simplification, then that would be probably a good thing. I think that uh, what Justin spoke to in terms of like mental health concerns and behavioral concerns uh, from kids who like didn't go to preschool because it was a pandemic, they didn't have play dates. I think we're just going to see that for a while, and that's okay. Um, and it's um, just a level that is added to teaching. That is a lot. And um, having the right people, not just people, but having the right people in the right places and having systems is really important. And so, like, consistency with those people, but also understanding it's super, super important. It is a thing like that's that keeps me up at night. I echo everything what my colleagues are saying in terms of mental health. Um, just recently walked into the nurse's office and there's a lot of kids out there. And you think oftentimes it's just it's physical health, but it's, it is mental health. Um, so I think a lot of our schools are just turning into community schools where we're dealing with mental health, physical health, lack of health care, lack of wraparound services, and it's clearly seen that there's those gaps. So when we think about clinicians, um, social workers, counselors, um, BIs, behavioral interventions, uh, I think those are, those are the staff that would help support um, anybody, whether it's, our, whether it's the admin team, whether it's teachers, uh, because we are taking on any roles in that sense. So thinking about, um, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I think just thinking about having special roles or specialty roles um, when we think about moving forward um, in our budget to support students and their needs. Because um, they are great, they are unique, um, and we need a lot of specialists there. Um, I think another factor to consider um, that's related to staffing um, and subs is that uh, what really jazzes teachers up about the work that they do is engaging in professional development that feels meaningful, even more meaningful when the job is getting more complex by the day. Um, and we have lots of opportunities for professional development in ACSD, but I think there's a level of guilt that some folks feel about engaging in meaningful professional development because of how challenging it is to fill um, teaching positions when they're out. So I also don't have an answer to that. Um, the, the opportunities are out there, there's great offerings. Um, it's supported, but I, I think 
it's a little bit of leftover um, feeling that people have around being out because of how hard it is to fill positions. Just a comment um, quickly. You know, the book, somebody asked me to do work, somebody asked about what the board could do. And a lot of times we, we're sort of helpless in this. Uh, and uh, it's a guilt to that. Uh, it's not that we, as people that are interested in education, don't want to fund certain positions, but constantly what we're hearing now is we can't even find even some of the most basic jobs. Uh, just, just looking right on through the whole systems. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is obviously not just an education issue. This is a societal issue. And we have to figure out how we break it up into the ways that we have some control as a board, uh, control or incentive or whatever. But on the other side, I just don't want to go home and, I, and feel guilty about that I haven't solved all the world's problems. And it is an issue, honestly, <clears throat> because it, it's how do we deal with all these special, not only special needs in a regular way, but everybody has a special need. Whether it's they have to play athletics, uh, or they have to be um, in theater, or they can't deal with a class that's bigger than four or five. It seems like we've done all this all the time. I've been on the board for a long, long time. We had diversified education. We had uh, this, where we needed to, although Charles was designated as a special place at one point. We did away with that for different reasons, I understand. But we seem to recycle a lot of this and then feel guilty that we aren't sort of accomplishing it. I know I do. I just I get frustrated by it. Not at anybody else, but just that being on the school board or being a teacher means you can't necessarily solve it all. And uh, society sort of thinks that's what we're supposed to do at times. That was my piece. <laughs> Sorry. I have a little bit of gold, I guess, in one of these sons of this huge. Um, Ingolf, for sure, was us. It um, was really nice to hear that fun things are going. Um, it gives me a lot of first thought. Um, there were a couple of things that I heard that really I want to think more about and learn more about. Um, like Chip was saying, the alternative programs, these other models that students need and would benefit from. And, um, you know, I just. I don't know really what's happening right now um, as much as I have in the past with these um, non traditional programs, but I think we should go out of support behind that if we have the ability to. Um, and then talking about substitutes, it makes me wonder if we ever considered having like a full time benefited position as for a full time sub or four full time benefited positions where they just float. And we just go on with that sort of thing. I don't know if you consider that sort of thing. Um, I am not that to the room, and I guess I could send a couple emails about um, some of the, I guess, more central office budget, like the structure, how things are going there. It's great to hear from the schools, and we get a lot of information from the central office. But it would also be interesting to hear in a similar way what's happening there. Um, um, oh, fantastic, thank you. No, that's coming. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that I was pre K. Um, I wonder about that too. You know, the status quo more or less. And at the last meeting, we talked about the facilities and the bonds and how we need to help with both into tiers or priority one and priority two, priority three. And when the student representative when asked, it was more about like the people than you know, not I don't know, it just his response is really interesting to me. And it seems like you have the luxury of talking about 
what happens in our schools every day in the same way. You know, we're not talking about, you know, a ten million dollar bond for priority one, not the schools, but you know, I just have the luxury to talk about if we have an extra two million dollars in the budget, what we would do with it a priority one, not Esther, but just on a day to day basis. Um, hearing what you guys wish you had in your schools, you know, what would really transform things. Um, you know, just be interesting to hear. But when you're planning on two and three, you know, how much would it cost? And you just, I don't know, it would have to change the world to be able to think about things differently like that. Um, and my final thought is about um, Rachel's best fellows to my home and then, um, there are a lot more students in this class um, than in some of the smaller schools, but overall, I'm curious about ratios, that's like a number email I could send, but you know, teacher student ratios and then total staff student ratios. He has access to a full time nurse and a full time music teacher, but ultimately he's in a classroom with over 20 kids in it, and he has been for most of his time here. And um, sometimes it seems like he gets lost in a shuffle. Um, so I just know value all the input, it gives me lots of things out in Google late night and I can't sleep other than, you know, cats and that sort of thing. You know, people doing their hair, I can like Google you know, some of the stuff. So it's for your time I've been. Did anybody else have their hand up? Um, thank you. I, I've been in this district for a very long time, and um, for many years, I think everybody who's been a teacher for a long time knows that what comes in in kindergarten and how solid they are will sort of predict where they're going to go. So many children today are in very stressful situations. Their families are in stressful situations, and we're not going to decide taking care of those really young kids. As educators, we get the end, we get the, now we've got to fix all the things that come up that maybe are providing for those kids at that time. I really feel like we need to put that emphasis right at the beginning, get really solid foundations for these children and their families. The more we keep adding things on later on, we should be putting that money down at the beginning and trying to build a stronger society coming up. Um, I work in the community doing a lot of outreach for some of the more needy families in the community. When I go to their houses, I, I know they don't have a chance enough of making it to school until somebody, until something happens early in their lives to help those families to get their lives together. So we cannot keep pushing it up. We've got to start really looking at the foundation for these kids. Creating, creating, early childhood, preschool, we need a society that really for our institution so we can then get on the and, and do it for our special community. Teachers are spending so much time establishing those social trying to remediate all the social needs that we're not going to be. Thank you all. Um, we really appreciate all of you spending time with us here tonight um, and getting your perspectives on your homeschools and the district. Um, and we hope that we can build you a budget that continues to support uh, the great work that you're doing um, and is hopefully added also um, so that we can explore new uh, programming and um, so with that being said, um, you are free to stay, and you're also free to go. Um, we thank you for your time. Really good. And you can do it for that. Um, we we can begin our discussion for the first time. I just want to thank you for that, sorry. To your side there. Um, I also want to thank um, leaders for being here uh, every day. I'm so grateful.
grateful to work with all of you. And um, I think it, when I see all of you together speaking, it, it's even that much more impressive. So anyway, um, thank you for everything you do. I'm concerned that 
in the end, what we could really afford for us, that isn't really going to help that much for the folks that really need it. Um, because we wouldn't be able to afford to. So, one thought I had is, is there a way to, those that have childcare costs, um, to be able to have, so that granularity, but maybe just a simple granularity, so that, you know, if someone's serving, they should at least be able to cover the childcare costs. Right? And I'm not sure the site would necessarily do that. Um, if we increase that, I would, I would be concerned about that. Um, so it was just a thought I had. One. So, um, the career center, when we talked about increasing ours, it was because of several reasons. One, we're struggling to get um, really our workforce investment people um, to join the board. I mean, they're busy enough with their own work lives, but then I had a lot of meeting. Um, just wasn't working, so that was one of the reasons. Another reason was that um, the amount of work that we were fighting that the career center had on its plate was increasing, and knowing that we were moving into a bond issue and having to do all the facilities work. There was more and more work that was being asked of people. Um, we found these increased tenfold of that life. So it was like that way. So we just, you know, we go to in Addison County, we didn't go anywhere else. And after I saw some statements that other boards have been getting, I was like, oh my goodness gracious. Um, but we, we went really just looked at the boards in Madison County, and um, that was where we had our papers. Um, but if, if we had not asked the voters to increase the stipends, um, board members previously received $50 for every school board meeting they attended. And if I think my numbers right for last year, the um, number of board meetings that we had was pretty much either equal the second amount or exceeded the second amount based on just full board meetings. So, um, and we, we also have members on our board that have child care issues and um, they were grateful for the additional funds, um, but I don't think we ever had a conversation around, you know, Pay for childcare and things like that. They were just thankful for some help to help them with those things. I think the basis of the statement originally was that trying to help what people were talking about, good childcare or other types of things. I mean, you can follow this argument all the way to the state legislature. My brother was a legislator for 10 years. There's no doubt he lost money in Montpelier. Uh, he was a farmer. He had to pay somebody to do what he was doing when he wasn't there. Now, what do you want to do it? That was a trade-off. <laughs> so to try to balance off whether how much each individual's child care needs may be or others, or someone like myself who's retired, uh, I think it's impossible. I think it makes sense to increase it somewhat at this point, just because we are not really in the same realm uh, you know, as some of our other compatriots. Uh, but I think we try to individualize this type of thing, it's just it's, it's too difficult. And I think you can either decide to be in the school board or not. Most people don't for many other reasons, certainly not because it might cost them money. Legislators may be a little different. I'm using that as an analogy because it is one in our same thing. But as far as school board goes, I think you either want to do it or you don't. If you're going to do it, hopefully there's some of this money that can be used to defray some of those things which you would have to pay out of and child care comes up or transportation from. Ripping a or whatever different. But otherwise, I think we should 
increasing uh, it would be uh, a problem with increasing it to a thousand. Um, we're in that now. But. No, we no, but we thought we'd bring it to the board to see. I mean, in my head, I was thinking, you know, if we look at um, boards in the district, you know, 1500, but I was going to throw it to the board to see what. Okay. The problem I just threw off the top of my head, but it, yeah. and honestly, it could be anything, probably more than the 500 is there now.
Yeah. 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 Um, I think that potentially true, and also to sort of level us up with other boards in our region. That makes sense to me. Um, but I do think about the financial impact of that, and I know, oh well, you know, not everyone will take it, or may not take it in the future. But it is money that we need to budget for, and everybody gets a fifteen hundred dollar stipend for a thirteen hundred board that's nineteen to twenty thousand dollars. It's not a small amount, and so I feel kind of conflicted about that, given all the other sort of things that are, fresh, you know, budgetary pressures on our district. And um, you know, when I think about nineteen thousand dollars and where else that could be applied, you know, so I'm, I'm honestly truly conflicted about this, um, and it, it feels awkward to talk about, you know. Uh, financial challenges and, and then also say, but let's go ahead and do this. So I <laughs> I really struggle with this. I, I guess um, I think at a fire meeting or one of our fire meetings we talked about the the rundown of others and it was between a thousand and fifteen hundred or twelve hundred and fifteen hundred. I'm just wondering how that compares uh, in terms of size of board and Maybe because there's 13 members that this work is divided amongst, whereas some boards have less. And I, I just been wondering whether that's been. Yes, you see, do you remember? I don't think. Do you remember from your Hanover discussions what the other boards in the district um, Okay, so, um, yeah, it, it's, so it's like about 1,200, it looks like it's pretty. But right, some of those boards are only seven people. Right, so I guess I, I just, I just want us to be thinking about that, and to Jamie's point about increasing increasing threefold, it feels like a big jump. Um, and I'm thinking about the timing of that big jump. <laughs> So um, I am I really having a hard time with 1500. I would advocate for lowering a bit, um, <coughs> but that's just me um, because I am always thinking about and talking about our bottom line and where we're investing that money. So that's where. I don't know. Sorry. So would it make sense to estimate what it? Would take to just offer child care and maybe you know food. Um, would that instead of raising, would that, would that at least we'd have child care? Yeah. It might be. I don't know. Okay. I'm super conflicted about that because I think that that's the best choice for children. Frankly, I, I have two. Now, teenagers have done work for six years. I could imagine bringing them every two weeks to these meetings, to be sitting in some room, in some school around the district. They should be home trying to have their own life routine. And so I would advocate more if we have this new um, flexibility with being able to be remote. And so I would advocate more for supporting people to be able to participate from their own homes and not support that. More so than I was driving children out in the school, job groups in that district. That's just my personal feeling. I know we've offered child care at this specific event. It's been very low uh, low attendance, low you know, rate of use. Snacks and stuff, you know, we could even bring our own snacks, you know, to share. We've done that with other um, committees that have been a part of that have been during their time. That would be sort of a low cost. To the district for those of us who might not mind bringing some the chair, but I definitely just I just have a little bit of a personal concern about children 
or being at their homes, even if the meetings started at 5 30. If, if it was afternoon, if it was right after school, I would have no problem with it. Um, it was almost like after school, but that's just my personal view on that part of it. So the emotion on the table um, has increased the second fifteen hundred. Um, do you want to vote on that, or does someone want to end that? What's the you know? What's the vote? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going against that motion. Or could we, if somebody wants to amend it, you can make a motion to amend it. And that has definitely rolled out the original motion. Yeah. I mean, so if you want to, if you want to make an amendment, you can do that in part, or we can just go in. Again. So we'll vote on 1500. If it doesn't pass, we can uh, make a motion for the second pass. All right. So um, the motion on the table. All those in favor, please say aye. And those opposed. Aye. Okay. So the motion is not passed. Um, does anybody want to raise a second motion? I know there's a motion. Okay, can I get a second for that motion? Sure. Alright. Discussion, questions, um, about the motion on the table. And for clarity's sake, we vote on this, and then it goes to the voters, correct? So this is not the end. It's not a done deal. Lizzie. With the um, the now the other. Uh, districts, the letter of the districts in the 12th grade. Um, how would say the bridge to ask to amend it to 12th grade so they're consistent with the other districts in the area? I have the press and just sleep by and not be around 1200. Um, but I will remind you that those those are also small yeah. so just I don't need to put it in the position of it yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Or we or we can vote on this motion and if it doesn't pass, we can move on. Well, I'm the motion to amend the motion on the table to uh, be Yes. So we have a motion about the motion on the table. Um, all those, is there a question or comment around this new motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of amending the motion on the table to raise the site to 1200, please say aye. And opposed. Okay, so the motion passes to amend the motion on the table to raise the stipend to twelve hundred dollars. So, are there any questions with the new motion? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of raising the board stipend to twelve hundred dollars. Please 